The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey there, welcome to the Bronx Buzz. This is BronxNet's program where we talk to writers and editors and journalists and reporters, videographers and filmmakers, uh, and anybody who's really putting something out in the borough of the Bronx. And uh, this evening, we're in our second segment. We're going to talk about the Cross Bronx Expressway, which is a thorn in all of our sides. And uh, in our first segment, we're also going to talk about transportation with the uh, transit reporter for The City. And it is uh, a pleasure to see Jose Martinez. Nice to have you with us, Jose. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, just a little background so people know who you are. Maybe they'll remember you from New York One or from the Daily News. A little bit how you got to the city at this point. I know you've been there for a couple of years, but just a little background so people know who you are. Well, the city.nyc is a nonprofit news organization that launched publishing officially about two years ago in April of 2019. And it's comprised of a lot of veteran and younger reporters who have been around the city for some time. In my case, I have been in newspapers, I've been in television. I spent uh, about 17 years as a newspaper reporter, most of that time at the Daily News in the Bronx, where I first appeared on your show going back two decades now, but we're not gonna age ourselves. Gary. I was gonna say, please, please. <laughs> and then I spent some time at the New York Post and then six years on air at New York One where I covered transportation, which is what I cover now at the city.nyc. And I have to say, it's, it's really one of the great beats in New York. And, and anyway, why, why, why do you feel that that's like, why do you love this so much? It hits everyone, it affects everyone. It is so important to the economy. It is so important to how people move around. And I think if you just look in the last year as to how much that has changed, you'll realize the subway is so central to the life in New York when you have uh, the, the economy being what it was, the ridership disappearing as it did during uh, so many months of the pandemic. Uh, it's a really different world when you don't have that central circulatory system that the subway and that the buses are. Uh, affecting life in, 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 in every way. You know, you've just, uh, I guess, unwittingly um, led right into what I want to talk about. One of the dialogues that's going on in the city right now uh, that is expanding as we get toward a, a new mayor uh, is uh, the notion of greenways and bike lanes. And uh, the city has done these road diets and some have not been received very well by local communities. Um, you did a story about um, a connected New York City a greenway. Um, let's talk about what the possibilities are. Of course, the next mayor will shape whatever we whatever we discuss here. But lay out the the, the groundwork, if you will, for what what this is about and what the possibilities are. Well, transportation has been altered fundamentally in some ways, as I as I just flicked that there in the opening uh, over the course of the last year during the pandemic. And one of the things that you've seen more of is people spending more time outside people commuting on bicycles, uh, people taking the new forms of transportation. So what I reported on uh, recently on our website was about a push by groups from all over the city to finally link a five borough connection of, of what is known as greenways. So these are uh, sort of park spaces. These are protected bike lanes that are physically protected from traffic, which is you know, obviously very important when you've had an increase in the number of fatalities of cyclists as we've had in the last few years here in the city of New York. So the hope among these advocates, and some of them are in the Bronx on the Harlem River, on the Bronx River, is to connect some missing links, if you will, in a 400 mile network of greenways that are around the city, but there are holes in that network. And the, the hope is that with some federal funding, at least $1 billion, that some of these links can be connected to the point where you then have a network connecting Brooklyn, Queens, 
Manhattan, Bronx, Staten Island, all without any gap in that connection. So you could, in essence, ride uh, on your bicycle all over the city uh, and, and really use it as another legitimate alternative for transportation. Having said all that, this is New York City and nothing goes down easy. Uh, I, as recent as this morning, I saw a, a good friend who posted a significant annoyance of uh, the bike lanes in Manhattan. Because he said, I stepped off a curb. I almost got killed by a motorized bike. Uh, I saw an incident where somebody I know I was with stepped off the curb and a bicycle just she didn't even notice and the bike ran into her and you people who ride cars and not to say that that may be preferred or not preferred but they're complaining because we lost parking spaces uh, uh now with outdoor dining which is of course here to stay uh we lost parking spaces how do we balance what i'm getting at is how do we balance the desire for an expanded greenway for the bike boom that's happening as well as some of those other things that I mentioned. Well, as you mentioned, the anytime you want to put bike lanes in the city of New York, it's going to be a contentious issue. I, I would know I live on the Upper West Side and I've seen the fights over bike lanes on Central Park West, on Columbus, on Amsterdam. It's always a struggle. It's back and forth uh, between a lot of different interests. And now with uh, the space being what it is, uh, everyone wants a piece of it. So you've got outdoor restaurants, you've got some sidewalk space that has been slightly uh, altered uh, by the changes that we've seen. And you've got an increasing number of people on bicycles. You've also got other forms of transportation, uh, such as mopeds, uh, so those e-scooters, uh, and it's a struggle for space. So it's really up to the city to find a way to make sure that it's a, a safe and uh, reliable form for all involved, but it is a constant struggle, as you said, and we, as I mentioned earlier, we've had an increase in the number of fatalities uh, of cyclists, so clearly something needs to be done there in terms of keeping cyclists safe, uh, but it's a balancing act of shared space, and that's the trick, is finding the way to make it work and, and to make it work safely for all involved. And, and many people who are making decisions on who they're going to vote for mayor uh, might want to consider what that plan looks like for, because each mayor is going to have to deal with it and, uh, you know, according to their preference. So uh, we will see. I want, I want to move on to um, a, a, another story that you wrote a little while back, which uh, I, I wasn't aware of when I read it. I, I kind of couldn't believe it that Governor Cuomo is looking to um, uh, expand the um, rail uh, access to and from LaGuardia, um, but the stop at Willits Point, which is uh, where City Field is, is not going to have uh, a di disabled access and is not going to be an accessible uh, stop. No, it, it is. It is. It, it what, seems what, a little odd to me. Let's put it that well, way. What, what, uh, what you have at Willits Point is, of course, Seven Train and the Long Island Railroad. Those are MTA properties. And so some years back in 2014, the MTA actually committed to making the Mets Willits Point stop at the Long Island Railroad uh, accessible to those with disabilities. So there was going to be an elevator going in, uh, there was gonna be a platform extension, there were gonna be some changes that would allow for people who are li of limited mobility to more easily get to ball games at City Field, uh, to tennis matches at the National Tennis Center, or just to go over there to Flushing Meadows Park, uh, because you know the, there's there's only so many stations in the subway and the railroad system that are fully accessible, and one that is as uh, even if it's not a full time station in terms of ball games and tennis matches, one that's heavily used is not it, it, that fully one. Accessible. Yeah, it's that that's so got to be. I mean, you've it, got to it, do it, that. It got caught up a little bit, if you will, in the planning that went for the air train. The air train. Uh, the connector between LaGuardia Airport and Willits Point, uh, that will be fully accessible. It's being built by the Port Authority. But one of the things that, uh, at least according to the MTA, uh, gets caught in all that is the plans to make uh, the LIRR stop at Mets Willits Point accessible. The promise was to have it ready by 2016. It's 2021. 
who knows when it'll be done, maybe by 2025, but you know, that's, that's a constant issue for the MTA, a real challenge. Uh, to meet deadlines and to make more stations accessible. Uh, you're a reporter. I'm a talk show host. I'm telling you, you can't put that stop in there <laughs> and not have it be fully accessible. Uh, I'm sorry. It can't be done. You can't put the money in and then say, well, but you guys don't get to go to the game. Sorry, that doesn't happen. It's tough. Yeah, you have to go to Woodside and then get on the seven and then back uh, yeah. ride and only one of the platforms. That, that, yeah, obviously. we we can't do that. Anyway, the, the last thing I want to ask you about is um, funding for the MTA. Uh, there was um, some um, uh, notice in uh, Albany when it was like the governor discovered a six billion dollars that would help the uh, uh, their budget negotiations, uh, and of course, infrastructure uh, funding as well as uh, stimulus funding could be applied to the MTA. Is the MTA and riders uh, less concerned now that there are enough funds to at least do some of the basic things we need to do uh, for the MTA uh, as we move forward now? Whereas, you know, just six months ago and nine months ago, it was like, oh my God, the thing is going to collapse. Right. For months, all we heard about from the MTA was if we don't get federal funding, we're going to have to cut buses. We're going to have to cut subway service. And they raise put, the price. That, that's always was part of the equation. Of course. Uh, and it could have been worse. Uh, they put the capital plan on hold. So what and, and also raises for the employees, layoffs. It was an ugly, ugly mess for an agency that had been through a terrible uh, last year when it lost more than 150 of its own employees to the pandemic. So it's, it's been a bad year all around for the MTA. What the federal funding does is allows the MTA to go through whole for the next few years. In other words, no major service cuts, no big layoffs. Things are secure for now, for now. That said, the ridership is still something of an issue because previously uh, you were moving north of uh, 5 million people a day on the subway. Right now, it's just at 2 million. Uh, the buses were carrying a significant number. It's still, it's gotten back a little better than the subway, but it still has to regain a lot. So that's a lot of revenue for the MTA that's lost. And, and they have to find some way to get back. The hope is that congestion pricing will bring some money into the system to allow for the capital projects to get moving again. But even though the federal money has helped the MTA and will get the MTA through the next year or two, uh, the future beyond that is less certain. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was waiting to get to a final word on that, a final assessment from you. And it sounds like the final assessment was hopeful. There's some money now, but the, we're going to have to keep feeding that piggy bank, so to speak. And and, and make it grow because the, you know, the, the needs are so uh, immense, and especially if you want to hold, hold the line on the price. Anyway, um, uh, that's all the time we have for our, our friend, Jose Martinez. What a pleasure to reconnect with you, to have you back on BronxNet television. Um, good luck uh, with uh, your continued work at the city. And uh, guess what's going to happen? We're going to invite you back. It's going to happen. It would be my pleasure. Thanks for having Great. me, Gary. And, Jose. Uh, and thank you very much. Great. It's, uh, again, a pleasure to see you. Listen, we're going to keep talking transportation, but another thorny issue, and that is the Cross Bronx Expressway. There are some plans out there that you're going to be very interested in. Don't go away. Who is most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC.
welcome back to uh, the Bronx Buzz. And uh, right now we're going to talk about another aspect of transportation in the borough of the Bronx. And this is something that, uh, goodness gracious, we have all dealt with. It's a matter of history. It's a 6.5 uh, mile long roadway. It's the Cross Bronx Expressway. We all hate it. People of the Bronx know how to avoid it. People from out of town, they sit there for hours trying to get across it. But um, uh, there's a big movement uh, to try and do something. Uh, Emily Nadal from the Mott Haven Herald uh, wrote about it. So nice to have you with us, Emily. Thank you. Nice to be here. And uh, Alexander Levine, who runs the Healthy Bronx podcast, but of uh, particular interest, he's a third year medical student at uh, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So um, Emily, let's just start with you. You wrote a what I thought was a very interesting piece about the Cross Bronx. So before we even talk about the specifics, what or was it that really interested you in saying, you know what, this is something we ought to take a look at? So I had heard the term capped across Bronx uh, on social media, but I really- okay, well, Let's be clear, cap the cross Bronx. Yes, capping okay. the cross Bronx. Um, and it, it was like a hashtag, right? Cap the, the cross Bronx. Um, and I was really confused about what that meant. And I really- uh, could it visualize it? And so I thought, if I can't visualize this or understand it, then there are probably other people who feel the same way. And so I really wanted to uh, report and write an in-depth story about what this means and what it could mean for the Bronx, why people want to do this, and how this could be made a reality. Uh, so really, did, it was just curiosity. Uh, curiosity got you started, but then you did significant um, research, and, and the piece I would recommend, uh, it's on both the Mont Haven Herald and the Hunts Point Express. Um, uh, what, what did you find? Is it a re Now, when we say cap, and I'm going to explain to people who aren't aware of it, it causes so much pollution and so much noise and so many problems in the Bronx. The thought is there are parts of it that could actually be covered over and make it like a tunnel instead of an open air expressway that spews fumes to everywhere. So um, did you get the sense, Emily, from your research that it's possible? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, <laughs> in a word, uh, yes. <laughs> totally. Um, it's not the first time something like this has happened, right? Um, there are examples of highways being capped or deck parks being built on top of highways all over the country. So uh, it definitely is possible. It's just uh, a matter of convincing people that this is what we should do. Uh, the Cross Bronx Expressway is, well, we all know it gets very congested. It's a heavily used uh, highway in the city and so you know when you tell people you want to build a you know a park on top of it um, people get worried they think somehow you know it's going to become even more congested but um, it's really of the six and a half miles of the cross Bronx, um, about a third of it or two and a half miles of it are below the street level um, so you could actually put a roof on it. You could actually just, do yeah, that. And then, of course, deal with, the, deal with the air or the fumes or things that come out of it through ventilation systems, et cetera. Um, let's go to um, uh, Alexander uh, Levine. Um, I, I guess somebody like you, uh, a medical student uh, in the Bronx, is interested in health. Uh, talk to me about the uh, Bronx, the Healthy Bronx podcast um, and why a medical student would do something like that. Um, sure. So thank you again for having me. Um, I'll talk about the Healthy Bronx podcast in the context of capping the Cross Bronx Expressway. Um, so in the last year, uh, I founded this organization with other medical students called Bronx One Policy, and we're focused on, um, for the year, we're focused on looking at uh, infrastructure and transportation projects that might impact health. And so on our podcast platform, we've done, a num though not all stories are about that, we've done a number of uh, stories about infrastructure and planning projects in the Bronx that um, could could have an impact on uh, on patients and the residents of our borough. And so that's why this story is particularly interesting to me, um, because there are major health implications, um, both from the fact that it was built and that it's been in the borough for so long, and also um, reimagining it can also have many impacts on health. Talk to me about uh, the reimagine uh, that you have in your head and say, if we could only what? Uh, so I think one thing that Emily and I have learned over the past couple months is that um, there's a lot of different voices in the community that have ideas for what this could be. 
And so it's not so much like what I think it might look like. It seems like if we believe there's this could be a health intervention, we really need to advocate for um, municipal, state, and federal funding and support to make this happen. And maybe, uh, you know, in the Bronx, we know that healthcare is the largest employer in the borough. So I think like healthcare professionals can also join the call to um, advocate for this. And then um, once that's done, there's an important planning process to ensure that um, what's done with that new space that's added is uh, for the communities where they are. So whether that's a park, maybe that's public housing, maybe that's an urban farm, um, it could be many different things. Uh, but I think the sort of reimagination is uh, not so much from important from my perspective, but from uh, the, you know, we say it's the Cross Bronx Expressway because it goes from the east side of the Bronx all the way to the west side of the Bronx. And so the communities throughout those different areas look pretty different and probably want different things. Uh, maybe we're making an assumption that we shouldn't make, and, and you're the health professional in this in this uh, little group that we have. What what are the um, the pseudo health uh, professional? I'm, a, I'm still well, in medical that's, school. That's true. <laughs> almost almost, uh, almost a health professional, I suppose. But listen, you're much farther along than I am. Uh, uh, let Let's uh, just talk about what are the the illnesses or the health um, uh, problems that are caused by this massive expressway where trucks and cars sit there for literally hours just spewing uh, fumes into the air. What, what, what has it done to the borough? Yeah, so as you said, as it relates to trucks, the expressway is an interstate, right? It's like the interstate highway. If you're from the tri-state area and maybe you've been on like the Merritt Parkway that doesn't allow trucks, the interstate highway system um, doesn't have those same limitations. So um, in a city like New York that has major congestion just because it's the most populous city in the United States, um, you're gonna have at any given time of day, you might have 18 wheeler trucks idling. And we said there's these exposed portions of the highway. So um, there's, you know, major uh, fumes and exhaust from these. So um, I, I want to list asthma, air, other airborne diseases. Yeah, so I'm getting disease. there. So then <laughs> well, I just want to move it ahead. So we have okay. time. Go all right, ahead. all right. So then so then we think about chronic disease. So we're worried about asthma, we're worried about um, the way that pollution can affect a lot of different parts of your health. Um, and then also, I think, we want to think about chronic disease more generally as it relates to diabetes, hypertension, and how the um, and how the highway affects people's ability to move and be more mobile. I want to visualize. One of the things I like to do on our BronxNet programs is to visualize what it could be. Uh, Emily, um, let's see. Um, two miles of the cross Bronx are designated as below grade, meaning the traffic runs uh, beneath uh, the street. You could uh, basically the idea is you could literally cover that over. Uh, and, and close it off so that, um, you know, it becomes a tunnel. Uh, and then the other side is um, you could uh, do a raised deck. This is uh, right out of your article on top of the road to create a, a, another type of tunnel. And then maybe the implication is imagine having a park or a walkway or some sort of greenway on top of all that. I vote yes. <laughs> what, what, what do you think? Are the, the, These are real um, uh, engineering feats that could be done. Oh yeah, totally. So those two and a half miles would obviously be the easiest to, to cap. Uh, just as you said, it would only be a matter of uh, sort of paving the top of it, um, putting the highway in a tunnel and using a, a vent to filter out the air pollution away from, away from that area. Um, all things that have been done before. Um, but the other uh, four miles could also uh, have deck, raised deck parts um, on them too. Uh, it would take a little bit more work, right? Because those are areas that um, have a different terrain. And so it's a little bit more difficult, um, but that's not to say it's, it's impossible. Um, so yeah, so once you have the cap, then you can build on top of it. You can um, do anything you want. Yeah, that, yeah. that, would, be, that would be absolutely, talk about a, a life change. Of course, the thought of <laughs> us in the Bronx thinking about the construction, I guess we're gonna have to deal with that with the hopes of something uh, in the end. Uh, Emily, do you have a price tag in your mind? Uh, you know, we say we need a billion, we need 5 billion, we need 10 billion, what do you think? Or, or at this point, it's way too early to, to talk about it. Yeah, I think that's the big question on everyone's mind. Like, who's going to fund this? How much is it right. going to cost? And it's a little bit um, unclear right now if we're talking about, um, you know, in the article, I talk about these different ideas and the different proposals. So there's um, 
the one acre, there's a two and a half, there's a whole six and a half. Um, but really, uh, the way that other folks have framed it is that the benefits of capping will outweigh the cost. Like the when you do an economic benefit analysis, um, the costs that we're putting into treating these chronic illnesses that stem from these fumes and the pollution um, could all be mitigated by taking away the pollution instead of putting in yeah, more so, money. So that rather than spending money in that direction, we'll spend it on this direction. Exactly. I mean, you know, these are uh, considerations uh, to look at. And uh, let's be clear, in which I learned from your article, uh, it, it sounds a little bit futuristic, but in fact, it's been done in uh, Seattle, Dallas, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Denver. They've all done uh, these kinds of things. Um, yeah. Alexander, uh, what, what's the next step, number one? one in general and for you in doing this. You got about 30 seconds and then we're going to give Emily 30 seconds as well. Uh, I think the next step is really trying to push um, policymakers who some who've, who have already stepped up uh, to fight for this to get funding in the infrastructure bill. Um, that's why this moment is so important because, uh, you know, we've heard at the federal level that there's going to be uh, Biden is pushing for this infrastructure bill. And we have other policymakers that are really interested in things like the Green New Deal. And if this can be built into Green New Deal policy and the uh, infrastructure bill, then, then this can actually happen. And I suppose having a, a New Yorker as uh, the majority leader in the Senate probably could not hurt as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Emily, for you, do you expect uh, to keep uh, writing about it? I mean, where, where, where are you at in um, your coverage of this particular issue? Yeah, echoing everything that Alex said about next steps, um, it all comes down to gaining support from the people who have the power to make this happen. But also on my end, I do want to continue following this story because uh, it's not going to happen without the continued community support. People from the Bronx, people who live in these areas, right. people who are directly affected by it, if they're not aware of what's going on and the process uh, where their, you know, opinion and voice matters, then it won't get done. I, I got to cut you off because we do got to go. But uh, Emily, what you what you are doing and what you have done is the best example of why we need good young local journalists, because you've brought an important issue and put it out. And guess what? We need good young doctors as well who are thinking socially consciously. And uh, so that's why Alexander Levine, uh, we wish you good luck. And we'll have you back as we move on on this uh, particular dialogue. I will tell you that we're gonna cover the same topic uh, with different guests on a Bronx Talk this week. I think it's a very important issue and we're gonna uh, spend some time imagining a better way uh, for that strip of land that, um, uh, you know, traverses our entire borough. Uh, thanks to our great producer, uh, Rebecca Hemick. Uh, Christine and Jalen are our interns. And we'll see you then on Bronx Circle. We'll see you back here next week. Good night.